Pressing forward into Charles Taylor's magisterial work, this is going to be chapter one, The Bulwarks of Belief. Welcome to Books and Big Ideas, What I'm Reading, What I'm Thinking About, with Joel Wentz. All right, so this is going to be a discussion of chapter one, The Bulwarks of Belief. And because of the nature of the length of the chapter and the complexity of the ideas, I'm just going to say that I, I'm not going to be able to tackle everything. I'm going to hot, do my best to highlight what I see are some of the key concepts and pillars of the overarching argument that Taylor is making. Um, so let's dig into it. The overall theme of the chapter of the Bulwarks of Belief is this driving question, which in many ways drives a lot of the project of a secular age. And that question is this, how did we, we corporately in the Western, Western post-European world, whatever, how did we corporately, communally, culturally go into, go from the year 1500 in which belief in God was not only assumed, but that being an atheist or not believing in God was kind of almost felt impossible in the year 1500? How do we go from that in 500 years to a totally flipping the script? How do we go from not only is it totally a valid option to not believe in God, but that almost it's the reverse. It's almost difficult to believe in God. It's contested. It causes, it causes tension to believe in God socially, culturally. How do we go from one to the other? In 500 years, it's not a lot of time in the scope of human history. Um, that's his big question. And so to get at that question in chapter one, he essentially is painting a portrait uh, of the things that protected and nurtured and sustained the assumption of belief in the ancient world, or the ancient world being around the year 1500. So hence the term bulwarks of belief. What are the things that provide bulwarks or support and a bolstering of belief? Not just for individuals, but just kind of for everyone um, in that culture. And so that's the driving question of the chapter, and that's the big theme of the chapter. And so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about, I want to spend more time in this video breaking down some of those bulwarks that he discusses, and I want to define them and name some of the important terms and ideas. Um, So what's the context in which people 500 years ago found themselves believing? And what are those bulwarks and how do they function? That's where I want to spend probably more time. But then the other thing I want to talk about is he he talks about those bulwarks, but then he also talks about what he calls the spirit of reform with a capital R. Spirit of reform and what shifted there. And I want to highlight that as I end the video because that's a really, really important piece of his overall argument and especially his take on the Protestant Reformation, which is really important to wrestle with. So, okay, let's get into the first part, which is the context of belief in the year 1500. What are these bulwarks? How does he identify them and how does he unpack them? Well, the first bulwark that I want to talk about is kind of this combo of the idea of enchantment and the idea of the buffered self. So enchantment and the buffered self, and these go together. And so what I I want to describe them like this. In an enchanted world, so his idea is that in 1500, the world was enchanted, intrinsically enchanted. And this is going to build off of some things in the intro, too, about where meaning and fullness can be found. Um, But the, the world is enchanted in 1500. And what that means is that things outside of oneself, literal things like objects, things that like relics, you know, medieval Catholicism, things can have a spiritual power and carry meaning in themselves completely independently of whether or not you think they should have meaning. Right, so this is an enchanted world. An enchanted world is something where a relic can have spiritual power that can impinge upon you whether you want it to or think it should or think that that's even valid. That's all beside the point because in the enchanted world, things have spiritual power invested into them. Or possibly, they possibly do. And spirits are active. Spirits are active around you at at all times. Um, This is the enchanted world. It's so, I'm spending most of the time on this bulwark because I think it's so important for his argument and it's so utterly foreign to us today, which is actually part of his argument. (laughs) Uh, And so in the enchanted world, things have spiritual power in themselves and that's the enchanted side. The buffered self side is also an important thing because in the enchanted world, not only did things have spiritual power and these things hang together, not only did things have spiritual power in themselves, but people were genuinely vulnerable to that spiritual power, that, that spiritual meaning it can impinge on you. And that means that the self in the enchanted ancient world is porous. That's the term used, is porous. And so individuals um, and communities and families and units are, find themselves in an enchanted world and find themselves to be porous to that enchanted world. Um, And those things, like I said, go together because the spiritual realm is active. 
things can be invested with spiritual power and meaning, and that can impinge on you because you're porous, you're vulnerable to it. Um, it's really crucial. It can't almost can't be overstated how important this is for the project that Taylor is trying to articulate and for his cultural theory about secularism. Um, because if people are genuinely vulnerable to this power and it's genuinely outside of themselves, then uh, the idea of the question of belief even being contested kind of never enters the equation, right? Think about that. If you find yourselves in a community in which everyone together believes in the essential spiritualness of existence and think that things can impinge upon you, like I said, and affect your life in a real tangible way, and you're porous to them, you are vulnerable to them, and that belief is all kind of embedded together in that communal experience of the world that is enchanted, then the idea of independently breaking off out of all that and just disbelieving in God, let alone all these spirits that Im Im affect the world, I mean, that just doesn't even kind of, it's not even really possible uh, in the sense that it doesn't even enter the social imaginary, to use another concept of his. It doesn't even enter kind of the way that you think and imagine the world, um, this possibility of disbelief. And so an enchanted world with vulnerable selves is such a different context than a disenchanted world with buffered selves, which is where we are today, 500 years later, as Taylor argues. So not only do we drain the world of enchantment and imagining it be enchanted and then thinking that things could have spiritual power, we also believe that we're buffered individually, and so we're not vulnerable to that spiritual power that we don't think is there anyways. It's this very fascinating flip. Um, and the entire social fabric, he's going to talk about embedded and being disembedded and embedded later on in the book, but the entire social fabric is kind of made up of this enchantment and vulnerability that everyone shares. Everybody shares. And so just think about, in this context, to the extent you can imagine living in that context, imagine being a medieval Catholic person and imagine going to mass and seeing the priest hold up the host, right? Hold up the, the wafer, the bread, um, and believing, really believing that, that there's like a spiritual power in that place and time and moment that can impinge upon you. That's going to be a powerfully different experience than how we typically, if you're, you know, Catholic or, or Protestant, how we think about communion or taking the Eucharist today. It's just radically different to be vulnerable to true enchanted to, to, to a truly enchanted existence. Um, and so that's that's a major bulwark, those two things together being vulnerable to an enchanted world. Bull is a bulwark to belief, right? It just holds up belief in God. Um, and not only belief in God, but like a real like hope that God will protect you and like and, and equip you and protect and protect you from the spiritual forces that might be against you. Uh, so that's the first one I want to discuss. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these others. I'm going to name them um, because they feed into the argument. But the, another piece he discusses is the, the approach and conception of time itself. And so he talks about sacred time versus secular time. Um, and this gets really heady, so I'm not even really going to try to unpack it in this video. Otherwise, it would get way too long. But suffice it to say that um, in addition to the whole enchantment, disenchantment thing, the way that we think about time is pretty flat in a secular world, whereas... Um, in the enchanted world, time was not flat. Time could really be gathered up in, in a sense, particularly in moments like in the mass, right, when you're elevated the host, time could be gathered up and you could be really experienced a sacred time communally. Um, and we, we just don't really think about time naturally or talk about time in that same way. But that's going to be an important factor that goes into the argument later. So in addition to enchantment and buffered selves, sacred versus secular time is another bulwark that holds up the possibility of sacred time and, and, and being kind of caught up in the fullness of a sacred moment is a bulwark for belief in the ancient world. And then the third one, this is really fascinating, um, is structure versus anti-structure. He talks about structure and anti-structure. And he talks about how um, the, this interplay between structure and things being ordered and neat and in their place, and then the place for anti-structure within a culture. And by anti-structure, he means essentially carnival. He means, and in, in the historical sense of that term, carnival meaning just kind of a, a disordering of things, like a, like a like a party, you know, where where the uh, jester would be the king, you know, momentarily, and things would be flipped upside down intentionally. That's anti-structure. That's kind of inverting the order or just create, letting chaos kind of take its, take its place momentarily in the place of order. And he talks about how in the ancient world there were a lot of rhythms like festivals and things like carnival, which is actually the kind of the root of carnival. Uh, things like these festivals would actually contain anti-structure within them. And basically they would... Being in an ordered world that's ordered all the time kind of builds up pressure, um, builds up stress almost, um, because humans need to 
release that pressure and have fun, frankly. Um, and he argues that in the ancient world, anti-structure was, was kind of codified into the, into the existence and the cultural understanding. And so these anti-structure festivals would pop up and give people places to blow off that steam that was built up by living in such strict order. And so this structure versus anti-structure rhythm would go back and forth and therefore overall maintain an equilibrium. Um, well, um, I would argue that we still have moments of anti-structure. Like if you've gone to an NFL game or something, you see people painted up and just get totally drunk and are just like, it's almost like decorum doesn't matter in certain settings at some times. Um, but the difference in our world to their world is that uh, in their world, it was, in the ancient world, it was named as anti-structure and it was known that the purpose of it was kind of known and this is why it existed. Whereas I don't think that we have quite that same understanding today, even if we do in somewhat similar, in the same things. And he's going to go on to argue that post the Ref Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, we've kind of almost eliminated an understanding of anti-structure from our, from our world. And so that's another bulwark that kind of plays into this whole shift from 1500 to 2000 um, is the loss of anti-structure. Um, another, uh, another one, so this is what, the fourth one, uh, fourth bulwark, is um, cosmos versus universe, being, being in a cosmos versus being in a universe. And I want to note another philosopher named Remy Brog has done some, in my opinion, very, very, very helpful work that maybe is a little easier to read than Taylor. So The Kingdom of Man is a book I'd recommend. I'll put up an image of that too. Um, but Remy Brog has done some great work on this point in particular, cosmos versus universe, and the shift from humans seeing themselves in a cosmos, and by that, Taylor means a cosmos being a place a place that is ordered around you and is larger than you, and you find yourself within it, and then the, the question becomes, what is my place and my role within this bigger ordered cosmos outside of me? And of course, that hinges really and is caught up on really believing in God, or gods, or spirits, you know, transcendent realities as a cosmos, whereas a universe, which is what we have moved into post, well, post a lot of things, Reformation, but also, of course, the Enlightenment and scientific revolutions and all of that, a universe is not intrinsically ordered, and in fact, humans um, kind of are tasked, ta tasked themselves with bringing order to a, universe, to a universe. So they find themselves, rather than finding themselves in a cosmos that is ordered above and beyond them, humans now find ourselves in a universe that we bring order to. And that is fed into by a lot of kind of scientific reasoning and all the things that we've discovered uh, post the scientific revolution, like I've said. So that's cosmos versus universe. Finding yourselves within order or bringing order to where you find yourself is one way to think about it. So I know I'm going quickly through this. I'm trying to keep these videos short and concise, but these are the bulwarks, the, the main ones I would see him discussing in chapter one, which is again, enchantment and the buffered self or the poorest self, uh, sacred and secular time, structure and anti-structure, and especially the elimination of anti-structure in our understandings, and then cosmos versus universe. And finding the, the ancient world, each of these bulwarks, when you take them all together, taken all together, it starts to paint a picture or a portrait or kind of gives you a landscape, a cultural landscape at least, in which the idea of, um, frankly, the idea of not believing in God or choosing again to disembed yourself from the social fabric that shares all of these things, disembedding yourself and just choosing not to believe in God, it just doesn't really make sense. And it's not a very viable option in that world and in that cultural landscape. Um, and so when you take all these things together, I think it starts to give, starts to give you a, a sense and you kind of wrap your mind a little bit around the shift that happened. And importantly, this is such a huge theme and I'm probably gonna come back to this in almost every single video through this book. A huge aspect of Taylor's project here is to argue that this was not inevitable, but these bulwarks were so strong and the cultural under the shared embedded cultural understanding was so deep that it was not inevitable that it would change. It was not inevitable that it would change. This is so important to understand to grasp what he's trying to argue, um, is that this change, this move into secularism in which belief could be contested and belief in God could be chosen or not, just like the, the landscape supported a very, very strong support and bolstering for belief in God in 1500, and just like it's shifted so strongly that, that to get over those bulwarks, to dismantle those bulwarks took intention and work um, and energy. And it was not an inevitable just slide into secularity. It was not an inevitable progress. It was not an inevitable choice, it, it, but it wasn't an intentional thing that humans, well, intentional or unintentional. I think there's a lot of unintended consequences is what he would argue. But, but the point is that it took work 
to be to create a different cultural landscape to supplant the one that has all these bulwarks of belief in it. That is such an important thing to get when Taylor talks or when you read what Taylor what Taylor's argued. Um, and so that leads into the final thing I wanted to highlight in chapter one, which is the spirit of reform, reform of the capital R. Um, this this spirit of reform is essentially his language for what I just what I just articulated a minute ago, which is this spirit of intentionally trying to remake society, right? To remake society, to dismantle these bulwarks, and to make society over into something new and something different. And this he would argue, and actually this is where it does get into unintended consequences. I think he would argue that the spirit of reform is what really led the way towards where we see ourselves today in our secular age. Um, but it was unintended because it was driven, in a lot of ways, it was driven by the Protestant Reformation, which was actually, of course, trying to maintain belief. But the point, though, that I want to end on here without, I can't, can't get too much farther into it without, again, without this video getting too long. But the point that I do want to emphasize is that this is an active spirit to remake society and that these things I talked about earlier, sacred and secular time, cosmos versus universe, anti-structure, and especially the buffered self, like these things needed to be driven through a reform spirit to dismantle those bulwarks and replace them with something new. So, a couple of small examples. Um, the drive to make all vocations sacred, which is a very, very strong um, Reformation legacy. To make all vocations sacred. This is a response to the sacred-secular split, particularly as it, as it involved monks, non uh, uh, nuns, and monasteries. I almost said monasteries. <laughs> monks and nuns in monasteries. And so the religious orders, to be religious in the ancient world was to be a monk or nun. Uh, average people weren't religious. If you said you were religious, people would think that you assume you lived in a monastery. And so the Reformation drive to level all vocations, essentially, to make all vocations sacred, which I would argue has some really, really good uh, intentions and, and some good ideas mixed up in that. I think there's important truths in there. But the drive to level all those things out uh, dismantled some of these other bulwarks, intentionally or unintentionally. It made all vocations sacred and therefore kind of almost or as Taylor would argue, diluted or watered down what sacredness meant. Because if everything is sacred, then nothing is sacred, right? Um, and that's kind of what he argues the spirit of reform led to. That's one example. Um, another, another kind of related thing is, um, in, in addition to making all vocations sacred, making all of time sacred. And this gets back to the sacred-secular time split. A really big theme is how the reform, as, as he argues it, and if you're a Protestant, this is probably going to challenge, in a good way, your understanding of the legacy of the Reformation. But... Uh, the Reformation tried to also level out the differences between sacred and secular time, uh, which also erodes a little bit of the theology of the Mass, right, as the, the medieval Catholic understanding, at least. And so sacred and secular time are evened out, just like vocations are evened out. And so, just like I said a minute ago, if all time, the, the idea is to make sure that there is, that, that people approached all time with, a, with an honoring of God in how they use their time, just like in they use their vocation. But the shadow side of that, which he would argue this eventually leads to, is if all time is sacred, then no time is sacred. And it effectively, if all vocations are sacred, if all of our daily lives are sacred all the time, and there's no difference between the sacred and the secular, uh, then eventually it almost just kind of all drains of meaning. And that, importantly, leads to what he would label disenchantment. So this radical leveling, driven by the spirit of reform, driven by trying to equal out a lot of these sacred-secular differences, which actually, he would argue, were those sacred-secular differences were actually bulwarks of belief in the year 1500. They're bulwarks. They bolstered up belief. They held it up. And the spirit of reform, particularly aided by the Reformation era, and other things going on culturally too, it's not all laid at the foot of the Reformation, but this kind of dri drive to reform and remake society over in a different way um, eroded these bulwarks, leveled out all these sacred secular differences, and then uh, intentionally or not, effectively drained the world of spiritual meaning and led to disenchantment and led to this buffered self reconception that we all carry. Um, and so, the last thing I want to say is that Taylor Taylor is really on a on a on a, a quest to describe. Um, he is um, he will offer critiques of certain moves culturally, of course. But he one thing that I love about his project is he's essentially just trying to say, with secularism, he's basically this is my paraphrase. He's basically saying, listen, the cat's out of the bag. He's not trying to put the cat back in the bag. He's not interested in trying to wind back to 1500 where all these these bulwarks of belief were in place, because he doesn't think that's the solution. He doesn't think that was necessarily all good. Um, but he is trying to say we need to think clearly about what really happened so that we can understand what it means to believe or not believe in our time, um, in our modern, postmodern, late modern, whatever uh, label you want to use, age. Um, and so there you go. There is my 
attempt at a summary and a distillation and an unpacking of some of the core concepts of chapter one, the bulwarks of belief, as we keep pressing into this book. Um, first of all, I hope that you find this helpful, if you find this reinterpretation or this, this repackaging interesting. But as we keep pressing in, I hope that you'll keep watching because these concepts that Taylor unpacks really layer on each other. And the, the, when they're all taken together, as you get further and further into the project, it builds out this extremely compelling argument about the place that we find ourselves and more importantly how we got here so there you go i hope you found this was helpful um, as always hope you found something interesting thought-provoking um, challenging as you've watched through this um, if this brings up questions or responses or thoughts for you um, then please of course as always let me know and as always thank you for watching